what makes this relationship successful is us seeing the very best of each other, us finding the best version of each other. And it really goes back again to even cherishing your partner and helping helping yourself see like what is working in your relationship. How can we make this better? How can we solidify our value of each other? How do I really build that up so that it's it's the most important thing that we create for ourselves? Welcome to the Stephoscope of Swaddles podcast, episode number 91. Hey mama, you deserve a life free of overwhelm and burnout. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. I'm your host, life and mindset coach, Shiro Bergbauer. I'm also a wife, mom, and CRNA. This is the podcast for high achieving mamas in medicine like you and I. Together, we'll learn how to navigate the ups and downs of working motherhood. If you're looking to thrive in your relationships and overcome overwhelm in your motherhood, marriage, and medicine, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. This is your host, Shiro Bergbauer. Welcome to the episode. I hope you liked Bella's introduction. That's my four-year-old daughter. She loves to be on the podcast, and so we thought it would be fun to get her to introduce this episode. So today on the podcast, what I'm going to be talking about is a concept that I learned in my training to become a Gottman leader for the seven principles of making marriage work. And actually, I believe it was in my level one training for the Gottman method. And so I wanted to kind of break it down for you in a way that's easy to understand And that is the concept of the sound relationship house. And so I want you to imagine the sound relationship house as a house. It's a house with seven floors, obviously walls, and a roof. So when Dr. John Gottman introduced his New York Times bestselling book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, he introduced this concept that a foundationally secure partnership is like a house. So it has weight-bearing walls, and then it has levels that we each build upon to create a sturdy bond. And so this is the sound relationship house. And for more than 20 years, the Gottman Institute has used this analogy to give couples the tools they need to have happy, healthy relationships. So what is the sound relationship house exactly? So I'm going to kind of just address what it looks like. I just want you to imagine a two-dimension image of a house. So you've got the floor, the walls on the side, and then you've got the roof. And on on the side of the house are the walls that hold the house up, and these are trust and commitment. And then, like I said, there's seven floors to this house, and I'll kind of walk you through what they are, and then we'll go a little deeper in explaining what each of them mean. So the first floor is where we build love maps. The second floor is sharing fondness and admiration. The third floor is turning towards each other instead of turning it away. The fourth floor is the positive perspective. The fifth floor is managing conflict. The sixth floor is making life dreams come true as a couple. And then the final level of the house, the highest floor, is creating shared meaning. So we're going to kind of go step by step of each of these um, layers. And then I'm going to kind of walk you through why I think this is so important to understand in a relationship, especially in marriage, because it's really understanding that, especially the weight bearing walls, right? The trust and commitment is what keeps a relationship in flow and what keeps a relationship thriving. But we have to build through these other layers in order for our relationships to thrive and for us to have this like solid foundation and and, and sound house for our relationship to be inside. So the first floor is build love maps. So if you think about love maps, I want you to think about how you could know your partner better by having this like guide through their inner world. So that foundation is the foundation of the home. It's it's knowing each other as a couple and it it really like helps us really get to know our partners. Like what does my partner like? What do they not like? Who are their closest friends? 
What is their favorite meal? Who are the friends they hang out with the most? What's their favorite sport? How was their childhood like? How do they like to practice self-care? So when we build love maps, we ask questions to learn more about each other. And basically, if you think about the Sound Relationship House, what we want to do on that first floor is really create a solid understanding of each other, right? You know, if you think about like when you, I, for example, for me, when I meet couples, when I'm going to put somebody to sleep and they're like, you know, we've been married for 30, 40 years, I always ask them like, what is your secret? And the reason I do that is because I want to understand like, what are the maps that got them to go and like what is the basis of their marital friendship and so having that friendship foundation is so crucial in us understanding the people we love in us understanding like what makes my partner tick what makes them happy what do they like to eat just the basic little foundational things that create friendship in a marriage that is so important for us to have a solid understanding of while we are fostering the relationship we have, right? Like why we are, you know, working towards getting to know each other better, having that friendship is so important. And it's it's really, the again, the foundation of that home, that's why it's on the first floor because we got to have that, like, understanding of each other. Last month when I was teaching the Seven Principles introduction, I did a workshop in September, I believe, and I was just talking about, like, why do we need to understand that? And building the love map really helps us to like deepen our knowledge of each other in a relationship and to build friendship and trust so that we can continue to foster that as we become parents, as we age, as you know, we have different issues in our relationships, we can count on the love maps and our understanding of each other to build our home and to build that sound relationship house. Some of the questions that you can maybe try to identify is, for example, like, do you know the, what, is, what current stressors your partner is going through? Do you know your partner's life dreams? Do you know the family member he likes the least, right? Can you list their major aspirations and hopes in life? Do, they know what, do you know what they're currently worried about? In doing so, we do this in a way that's supposed to be fun, and I'm going to share some of the resources from the Gottman Institute. And I'm also going to share my good friend Maggie Reyes' questions for couples. She actually just came out with a card deck. And these are like some good questions you can ask each other and try to understand each other from just in a fun way to get to know each other. So it's not like, you know, if if your partner can't answer the question, it's like this terrible thing. It's just something to realize, oh, we have this like knowledge deficit, like, oh, I don't know who your closest friends are. It's like, you know, do you know your partner's favorite color? Do they know your favorite color? So that is the basis of building that sound relationship house. The second floor is then about sharing fondness and admiration. And, you know, as human beings, we want to hear good things about ourselves. And so when it comes from the people that we love the most, it's like we appreciate ourselves even more, right? Like for me, sometimes when I think about my husband, he has a very good sense of humor, And it's a very interesting sense of humor because sometimes he tells jokes that I find hilarious and other people might be like, what? What was that? We're very clear with each other, like the things we appreciate about ourselves. And we can articulate those reasons, like large or small. What do we like about each other? Now, I want to say that, you know, it doesn't it's not like this easy thing that you just like, oh, yeah, I know, you know, all these things about my partner and I appreciate them. But, you know, when you think about the concept of small little things, small things often, I apologize, you know, that's how we begin to nurture that fondness and admiration, right? Because it's so easy for us as a couple to take each other for granted. And it can it can just be like getting caught up in the mundane activities of life and just realizing, wow, we, we're not really connecting. And so when we openly share with our partner what we appreciate about them, it strengthens that bond. And we create that firm foundation of affection, honor, and respect so that it's easier for us to overcome problems, problem areas in a positive and productive way. When we build that culture of appreciation in our families, it also protects us from one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is contempt. Because we can go back to the things that we admire about our partners and remember that we're fond of them, right? We remember that we're a team. We remember why we fall in, fell in love with them in the first place. 
having that friendship is the basis for passion, intimacy, and honestly, good sex. Because when your friendship is strong, then other areas of your life start to thrive. So if you are experiencing a season in your life where this is not the case, I just want to offer you that this is this is an area that, you know, you can rekindle your affection and fondness and admiration. All is not lost. So how do you even begin to maybe even pursue it? I'm going to offer you like maybe some tips for what you can reflect on or journal on to just kind of maybe get a better understanding. And the first one is, what are what feelings and memories do you have of your partner early on in the relationship? The second thing is coming up with appreciation of your partner. And so it's coming up with five things that you lo- you would like to appreciate of, about your partner and be specific about it. So be specific about the example of when your partner displayed that action or the quality that you appreciate. And maybe come up with a list of five and then share it with them. And also maybe like take a trip down memory lane in your relationship and see like maybe any insights you gain as far as your perspectives and relationship with each other. I was recently coaching a client and she is in a long distance relationship right now. And in our coaching, I shared with her the journey that my husband and I went through when we first met. And I don't know if I've shared that much in the podcast, but my husband and I met in 2009 when I was about to start grad school. And he was working for an Austrian company here in the U.S. And then our first year of dating, he had to go back to Austria. And we had to make like a lot of decisions whether we wanted to be together. And it took about four years back and forth for him to finally settle down in the U.S. So this season was very difficult. It was very much like we had to hold on to like faith and hold on to our belief in our relationship. It was hard. But when we go back down memory lane, like I was reminding him, there was a day when I came home from school and he was like, I just found out I have to go to headquarters. There's a problem. And, you know, I might might have to move back and, and go work there. And we were both laying in bed crying. And I look back and we could have never imagined the life fast forward, you know, 12 years, what we have now. And so going back down memory lane even just helps us see, like, what are individual perspectives of each other? Because... At the time, I was so focused on being in grad school, but I also knew that, like, this relationship was important to both of us. And so we had to, like, figure out a way to balance the two. And so when I was coaching my client, I was just telling her, when you're in those situations, it's hard to see the future. It's hard to forecast the future. And you really literally have, like, you're led by your 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 resilience is led by faith. Like, you don't know how it's going to turn out. You just hope for the best. Going back to fondness and admiration... The other thing you can do is come up with 10 qualities that you cherish in your partner. Share that with them. And these can be like, I'll give you some examples, adaptable, dynamic, inquisitive, persistent, spontaneous, supportive, brave, calm, capable. Come up with a list of ways to describe your partner. The other one you could do is write your partner a love letter and express how much you cherish him or her. And you don't have to, like, give it to them as a letter. You can read it to them on a date night. You can kind of share some of the insights on a date night and share that with them. Coming up with, like, activities and fondness and admiration really is about purposefully choosing thoughts that we want to think about our partner and then taking action. So some of the thoughts that you can choose is, you know, like the thought, I'm genuinely fond of my partner, And maybe coming up with a characteristic that you find endearing about them. Or my partner, you know, has specific qualities that make me proud and come like, what are those qualities? So I will share with you the Gottman app. It has a lot of like little exercises, but it gives you some insights about how to practice that. Floor number three is turning towards each other. When you want your partner to communicate with you and connect with you, right? I've shared on this podcast about the magic five to one ratio. And if you take a look at the ratio of positive stuff during conflict, like like interest, asking questions, being nice to each other, being kind, being affectionate, and being empathetic, and the negative stuff like criticizing each other, hostility, anger, hurt feelings, and then you take that ratio of the positive to negative, In relationships that the ratio was five to one, 
those couples stayed together. So one of the things I'm very clear with with my clients is conflict will always be there in a marriage. Like, don't let anybody lie to you that you'll never have conflict. But this magic ratio is what determines the longevity of your relationship because there are five times as many positive things going on in the relationship than there are negative, right? And this situation means that if you do something negative to hurt your partner's feelings, that you have five other things that make up for it. It's not balanced in terms of positive and negative because negative actions have way more weight and they can inflict way more danger and pain in a relationship than positive ones, right? So how do you even understand that? You know, how do you, how do you even try to, like, create that? The concept of creating that is that emotional bank account And it's knowing that you're building that relationship. You tap into into building that relationship. You connect with each other no matter how small those connections are. It's like depositing little coins into a piggy bank. When you need $5, you can go back in there and pull that out, right? Because every time you make an effort to listen and respond to your partner, you make your marriage just a little bit better. Turning towards each other, again, I talked about bids. I'm going to go back and check in which episode. So we talked about bids for connection in episode 68 of the podcast. So if you didn't listen to that episode, it goes further into detail to show you how we like turn towards each other. And maybe coming up with a list of the things that you appreciate about each other and activities that you like to do together And what activities maybe do you want to continue to do together may help you kind of learn how to turn towards bids for connection. The other thing is when you are, you know, having conversations with your partner, being cognizant of how you are responding to them so that the conversations are, one, they start with soft and startups, but paying attention, like listening, listening with the intention of like, being present. It's not just like passive listening. And having these like conversations too can help you maybe adapt to, you know, different ways with with your partner's moods change or, you know, you still have a way of connecting. As part of the seven principles of making marriage work, one of the things that I learned was when we create an, an ongoing and habitual way of turning towards each other, we can have these stress-reducing conversations to enable us to do that. And so what that can look like is really showing genuine interest when your partner is speaking and vice versa, not giving unsolicited advice, communicating that you understand what they're saying, and then express this you know, attitude that it's us against other people. And this comes in handy, especially in relationships with family members, in-laws, being able to like have that solid like we are together and then there's everybody else expressing affection by like maybe saying i love you touching them just being able to express that affection and then validating their emotions like if your partner is sad or angry validating that yeah i you know that's really sad i will be worried too or i'd be sad too i can see that's frustrating for you noticing how you're like connecting with them So the fourth floor of the Sound Relationship House is the concept of the positive perspective. And the positive perspective is really helping us understand how, like how, like much of life is really how we look at it, right? So when we are in relationships where we see the best in each other and we don't rush to offend and criticize each other, then we can have that positive perspective in our relationship. So, you know, like, Having the awareness of being a team versus an alliance helps you have that positive perspective. Like you understand why your partner does certain things and you're more willing to show up in compassion and curiosity towards them, helping them really, really like understand you and and really checking in on each other. Like what makes this relationship successful is us seeing the very best of each other, us finding the best version of each other. And it really goes back again to even cherishing your partner and helping helping yourself see, like, what is working in your relationship? How can we make this better? How can we solidify our our value of each other? How do I, how do we, you know, how do we really build that up so that it's it's the most important thing that we create for ourselves? 
So having that perspective is super important because we can really kind of tune into that and going back to that five to one ratio, we can go back to that in moments where we feel like we're not understanding each other, we're not, you know, we're frustrated. And there are certain ways in which you can do that is having that positive perspective, which one is to let your partner influence you. And, you know, we can allow our partners to maybe help us see things differently. We can also increase our fondness and admiration in order to have that positive perspective. And last but not least is turn towards our partners when they bid with us for emotional connection. So this will help us keep that positive perspective in order for us to keep going further in our relationship. On the fifth floor, I think is one of the most important things, which is managing conflict. In episode 79, I talked a little bit about how to manage conflict in relationships because I think many of us were raised with the idea that like, if you have something going on in your relationship, there's something terribly wrong or like the idea that we shouldn't have any conflict. And, you know, I talked about in that episode where there are solvable and and perpetual problems in marriage. And you get to decide, like, do we want to spend our time in these perpetual problems unless they become a gridlock? We don't have to solve them. Right. So it could be like when we have disagreements about like how we spend money or our religious beliefs or our cultural views, we can decide to let each other influence each other without changing each other's minds. And we can decide to solve the solvable problems because that's where the work is. If we spend all our energy and effort in our relationship solving problems that have no solution, it's such a waste of time. Like we're not going to change our partners. We're not going to change their stance on certain things, but we can absolutely respect how they choose to perceive things. We can absolutely respect how maybe they solve problems and then we can we can use that to leverage our relationship instead of making it like a negative thing that they're different from us, like actually realizing, wow, like the variety is the spice of life, right? If we were all the same, this would be a pretty pretty boring planet to live on. Like it wouldn't be fun, right? So repairing is also a very important concept here as far as managing conflict. And the reason why that is important is that the Gottman research showed that the success of or failure of a couple's repair attempts is one of the main factors in whether the relationship is likely to flourish or flounder. And so these are really the secret weapon of emotionally intelligent couples. Even though many couples aren't aware that they're employing something so powerful. And so repair attempts can look like taking breaks during conflict, maintaining a sense of humor even when there's problems, being good listeners even when our partners have different positions, right? Pulling out and changing things when things get heated and soothing ourselves and soothing our partners when we feel flooded. It can also just be like expressing to our partners how we feel, expressing remorse, expressing when we need to calm down or stopping certain conversations by saying, you know, I'm feeling flooded or I want to change the topic or I just appreciating each other during conflict. So those are so important for us to pay attention to because they do come in handy in a conflict. Like, how do we even repair that? The other thing is to going back to like knowing the signs that you're flooded and having awareness of that because that may be a problem in your relationship. And so If you sense that that is an issue, right, like if your discussions get too heated or one of you has a hard time calming down or you seem not to talk logically to each other or one of you has a list of unreasonable demands, that is important to notice that those are maybe the things that get you flooded. And then in solving conflict, I think it's also important in in us supporting each other and soothing each other when we can. And that's so beneficial because it's like if we frequently have the experience of our partners soothing us or us soothing them, we come to associate our partner with feelings of relaxation rather than that of stress, right? So it it automatically increases the, the positivity of our relationships. On the sixth floor, we talk about making dreams come true. And one of the tenets of good companionship is to have somebody who believes in you and, and who encourages you in your goals, but also helps you reach them. And it can be so many different things as far as like making dreams come true. But one of the most interesting things that I have seen in my work 
is sometimes we don't know each other's dreams and sometimes we don't know what our partner's ambitions are. Or sometimes we're afraid of being vulnerable and sharing our dreams with them because they may not be supportive. And so just know that like dreams can be from so many different levels. They can be practical, they can be profound. And most of the time they're like rooted in our childhood or from our significant life experiences. So some levels of dreaming can come from, you know, our sense of freedom or, you know, being productive. So think about like your sense of freedom as far as finances, right? If you have a dream that you have, like you want this financial freedom and you never shared it with your partner, but then every time they spend money, you freak out, right? There's a hidden dream there. Like you have this vision and you haven't communicated it. It's so important for us to like understand our own dreams, but also detect each other's dreams in a relationship Especially if there's a gridlocked issue in our marriage, like I said, like the issue of like money or let's say it's like I'll give you another example that the in in the work that we learned is like what maybe one person in the relationship is like my wife is too neat and she's too tidy and and I just find myself like I'm just like anxious and I think she's inconsiderate. But then the wife is like, I like a certain amount of order and neatness in our home. And so I'm always cleaning up after his mess. Right. It could be that one of the, like, the the husband, right, his dreams within conflict might be that he wants to feel free in his own home, right? When he was a child, maybe his mother was always concerned about, like, impressing people in the house being perfect and da-da-da-da. And he just doesn't want that, right? And maybe in Ashley's version, the wife, she's like, well, when the house is a mess, like, it takes me back to the chaos of my childhood, and I just want to have that, like, structure, So it's so important for us to, like, understand each other's dreams because we may be having conflict that's just related to us having undetected dreams. And also, when we know our partner's dreams and we value them, we don't even have to contribute to them, but we know that they know that we support them. I always use the example of, like, when I started my business, my husband was just like, you usually have an idea of what you want to do and you just go with it and I'm just going to support you. Because I don't even know what it is that you're doing. And recently, I was speaking at a, at a workshop, and my husband told me, he was like, when I like when I saw you, like I just know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's like the highest level of support for me, is to feel that my dreams are validated and that I have a partner who sees them and sees the vision that I have, which is to help so many women and to support so many women. So he sees that and he values it. He may never understand it. And that's okay. So on the seventh floor is where we create shared meaning. And so just like if you think about the foundation, here on this level, now we're now building and understanding the inner world as a couple, right? So that can look like developing symbols and rituals that express the couple as a team. And it can be simple things. And one of the things I wanted to share is as far as shared meaning Recently, I was telling my husband that I was kind of sad because we had planned on going to Austria for Christmas, and then we had to change plans because of some conflicts. And I was telling him, I'm like, you know, to me, Christmas is like being with family and all of this. And he said something to me that I hadn't really thought about. He was like, we can start to create our own Christmas memories. And I realized that we have certain rituals as a family, but we don't have big ones around the holidays. And this is a challenge for us. Like, this is our shared meaning where we can start developing our own culture of our marriage. Because, again, our families of origin are two totally different cultures. But we can build a culture of a multicultural home that's specific to us. Again, you know, developing a culture in in the relationship doesn't mean we agree on everything and we see eye to eye. We just, like, we mesh and we find ways of honoring each other's dreams, even though we might not always share them. And I talked about rituals in a previous episode, but it, you know, when we set up these rituals, it, it helps us like really create that culture of our family and, and traditions that we can pass on to generations behind us. But it also gives our relationships some sort of basis. Like this is what, this is like the foundation of our relationship. This is what our rituals look like. This is what we have, we put meaning to. And so you just get to decide what that looks like. Last but not least, we're going to talk about the weight-bearing walls of the home. Now, as important as the floors are, right, 
we can't make that work without trust and commitment. And so in a healthy relationship, we both decide to trust in each other and stay together, right? We continue to make that love grow and we foster that for ourselves. So when you think about trust, it's really, it's really, really important that we have conversations about trust if there's any doubt that we trust each other because trust is a crucial aspect of intimacy, right? So we have to like know that we can count on each other. We are a team. Like driving that point home, like us being a team is the most important aspect of it. So we have to learn to trust each other. And when we find ourselves mistrusting, it's time for us to like go into inquiry and understand like what are the stories we tell ourselves? What is causing us trust mistrust? And a lot of the time it could be a fear of loss, a fear of abandonment, you know, or something that happened in a previous relationship or even in the same relationship. Maybe there was some question of an infidelity and you moved on as a couple, but it still keeps coming up. I think that is so important to address because you can't get to where you can be honest and communicate if there's mistrust in the relationship because one of you is going to be holding back. And, you know, as far as commitment, it's like that decision, right? It's it's a decision that no matter the ups and downs, like everything is for the future of the relationship. And my husband and I joke about this all the time because we're like, we went through so much stuff that commitment is just like part of who we are. Like we're committed to this relationship. We're committed to raising our daughter together. And it's important to us because we wouldn't have fought so hard for it if we hadn't been committed. Right. So in commitment, it's important for us to understand that we're really here like for the long haul. Like we're here for through thick or thin. Now, I'm always very clear, thick or thin does not mean anything that like threatens your safety. So being so aware of that, like how can we, you know, take care of ourselves and and be in the relationships in commitment, but also be aware that our safety matters. So I wanted to really break down the sound relationship house and and help you like understand it and visualize it. And I'll include an image of the sound relationship house in the show notes so you can kind of see for yourself what it looks like. But I thought this was important for us to start like knowing what are the steps? Like how do we solidify and strengthen this relationship and what is the work in it? And so if you are struggling with any of these areas, be it, you know, the weight bearing walls or not maybe knowing your love maps, struggling with fondness and admiration of your partner, not knowing how to turn towards your partner, having conflict, not knowing how to appreciate your partner's dreams, and not having shared meaning, and you want to go deeper into this work because this is the life that you desire, but it's not what you're seeing right now, I can absolutely help you. I want to offer you an invitation to come on a one-on-one consultation call with me so we can see what has been working in your marriage and what hasn't been working, and then we make a decision to change that. And that comes with the work. See, you can listen to the podcast and I share so much information and I I do that on purpose. But I want you to be clear that if this is like work that is important to you, information is great. Information gets you to curiosity and starts getting you awareness. But transformation is in doing the work. And that's what we do in coaching. We are making transformations from the get-go. And so I want to invite you, if you're ready for transformation, I want to invite you to book a consultation call with me. Go to www.stethoscopestoswaddles.com forward slash consult. And I will also include consultation. And I will include this in the show notes if that is something that you're interested in. I can't wait to talk to you. And I hope you have a good rest of your week. All right. Bye now. I'm Shira Bergbauer. And you've been listening to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. New episodes are out every Monday. These episodes are created by me, Shira Bergbauer, and produced by Cassidy Mitchell. If you enjoyed this show or found it helpful, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts. The concepts I share on this podcast resonate with you or you're ready to change your relationships and mindset, I can help you. If you'd like in-depth, personalized support, I'd love to invite you to apply for my Life and Mindset coaching program. 
Just imagine you and I every week working together as I teach you the tools to up-level your life. To book your free one-hour consultation call, go to www.stethoscopestoswaddles.com forward slash consultation. You're doing a great job, Mama. Have a great week. Bye now.